Good day, everyone, and welcome to step seven, <clears throat> a community initiative to, to design the pathway to a long-term remission of HIV infection. This is brought to you by the European AIDS Treatment Group, EATG. My name is Sean Hosein, and I'm the chair today. Uh, so just in summary, we have um, uh, several speakers who will talk about the projects related to, um, to uh, remission and possible cure. And um, I will introduce each speaker before they start. We'll have time for one or two questions after each speaker. Uh, we ask your, to make your questions brief. And then at the end of all the speakers, we'll have a few more minutes for other questions. Um, this is the first of uh, many uh, uh, webinars or sessions that we hope to have in uh, starting in 2022 and for several years after regarding HIV remission and cure. So I'd like to tell you about a few important reminders. The meeting is being recorded. It will be made public. Please turn off your camera and change your name if you do not wish for this information to appear. And of course, as with all webinars, please make sure you're on mute during the presentations. And any questions after, um, you, you can ask them after each presentation. We have a chat uh, function, which uh, some of you have used before. And if you're experiencing any technical issues, if um, you know, there, there are problems and, and you've rebooted your computer and you still have problems, you can uh, contact Fiona, uh, one of our wonderful EATG staff here, who is standing by to help us with technical issues. So those are important reminders. Uh, so now I'd like to go to our first speaker. I'd like to talk a bit about him. His name is Professor Joachim Uba, and he's a uh, with the Heinrich Petta Institute, Leibniz Institute for Experimental Virology. Um, Joachim, also known as Yogi to his friends, is a German virologist who obtained his PhD from Ludwig Max Max Maximilians University in Munich. As a postdoctoral student, he worked at Hoffman La Roche in New Jersey and at the prestigious Howard Hughes Institute in Durham, North Carolina. In the late 80s and early 90s, he was head of the molecular biology department at Sandoz Research Institute in Vienna. He later was a professor at the Institute for Clinical and Molecular Virology at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg. And since 2002, he's been professor and head of the research unit of antiviral strategies at the Heinrich uh, Petta Institute at the Leibniz Institute for Experimental Virology uh, in Hamburg. And um, he will talk to us today about some of the cure slash remission research he has been working in. Joachim, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. I try to share now my screen. Okay, you see this? Yes. Okay, once again, thank you very much for this kind introduction. I would like to talk over the next minutes on our on the status of RAG1 technology and our development and uh, application for an uh, early clinical trial. So the, the BRAC technology and particularly its application to uh, people living with HIV has been conducted in Hamburg, Germany, on campus of the University Medical uh, uh, Hospital here, uh, Medical Center. Uh, this is what you see here. And the Heinrich Pett Institute is here located to the north of this on campus, actually. Um, so we are using genome editing, editing strategies against HIV, and there are basically two approaches in these days. First of all, to trying to knock out the gene encoding, for example, for CCR5 co-receptor. And the other strategy, 
uh, is to take out the integrated pro-viral DNA. This is the avenue we are taking uh, with our BRAC technology, because we believe that if we talk about eradication in the long run, any attempt um, that takes out the profile DNA will be of, 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 of a large benefit to, uh, to for cure, basically. So uh, we decided to uh, use uh, designer companies, which we generated or engineered together with our colleague Frank Buchholz from the Technical University in Dresden, also in Germany, which is called BRAC1 or Broad Range Recombinase because it uh, recognizes uh, uh, the fast number of, of all clinical HIV or clinical relevant HIV isolates. Uh, we are using uh, recombinants technology as opposed, for example, to, uh, to uh, designer nucleases because recombinants do not cause so-called indults or insertions or deletions. So they act as opposed to CRISPR, for example, they act error-free. They do not rely on cellular DNA repair. They do not introduce or cause free DNA double strand breaks. Uh, these are the main reasons, actually. And they are also unproblematic uh, with respect to delivery because one has to deliver only a single open reading frame and not the gene, for example, for the nuclease in addition to multiple guide RNAs. So the idea is uh, to introduce the gene or express the BRAC recombinase in cells that are HIV infected. BRAC recognizes the LTR sequences at the beginning and at the end of the integrated HIV genome, uh, recombines the sequences and takes the genes, the HIV genes are almost the entire HIV genome or provirus out. This excision product is transient, it cannot reintegrate and it's degraded eventually in the host cell. So the infected cell or the infection at the cellular level is reversed and uh, the infected cell is now free from HIV. So delivering, for delivering into the uh, uh, subsect uh, cells, uh, we are using uh, one of the most advanced lentiviral self-inactivating vectors. And uh, we generated or we expressing the BRAC recombinase from an internal promoter that is responsive to HIV. So in HIV infected cells, when HIV is activated, the first and most essential HIV protein that is uh, formed or synthesized is the TET transactivator protein. And also this uh, gene vector is responsive to TET. So only in HIV infected cells, we express practice like a switch, turn on, turn off. And this is shown on this little, little movie. Yeah, it works very, very good here. So important to say here is that every step you see in this movie, we can prove experimentally. Uh, so this is not science fiction, basically. So what you see here is that HIV infects the cell. That we are in the nucleus of the immune cell of a CD4 positive lymphocyte. HIV integrates its genome, the so-called proviral DNA. Now the HIV genome is uh, transcribed by cellular polymerase. RNA is formed, moves to the cytoplasm for translation. And the first protein, most important HIV protein that's formed is the TET transactivator. And TET now also activates our BRAC gene vector. So if transcription of the gene vector, the recombinase also is formed at the cytoplasmic ribosomes, re-enters the nucleus and in a very, in a highly specific way, it recognizes integrated proviral DNA wherever it sits in the human genome, recombines this uh, LTR sequences. 
and excises the HIV genome. And as I mentioned, this cannot reintegrate anymore and is eventually uh, uh, degraded in the, in, fact, in the originally infected host cells. So we conditionally express BRAC1 only in no, de novo infected or activated HIV infected cells. And from our point of view, this is a big margin of biosafety here. So there are antiviral effects. Certainly we have performed series of experiments uh, in, in tissue culture, including in primary T cells uh, uh, isolated from people living with HIV. And there is pronounced antiviral activity. But most important, I have put in this slide here is shown on the, uh, here at the bottom of the slide. So we have just seen Upon excision of the proviral DNA, there is this transient circular excision product, which is finally degraded. And we can sequence this uh, junction in this excision product. This is shown here in this boxed area. And what you can see here that it, basically every nucleotide upon break activity or upon recombinase activity is maintained. So uh, designer recombinases as opposed to nucleases act with nucleotide precision. And this is exactly what you wanna have when you go with such enzymes into human beings. So there is in vivo activity, as far as we can tell, in humanized mice that are infected with HIV. These are just two examples. On the left-hand side here, we see uh, uh, animals uh, that were engrafted with primary T cells from people living with HIV. And you see HIV replication here in these animals over time. However, when the animals contain BRAC recombinase or the gene for BRAC recombinase, the gene vector we see almost with the same kinetic or similar kinetics between week 10 and week 20, complete decline of viral load, of plasma viral load. It never comes back. It goes to below the limit of detection. On the right-hand side, what you can see here, this is a section through the spleen. Again, when you look in HIV-infected animals, you see these little red dots in the spleen. These are all HIV-infected human lymphocytes. If you look into the animal that is spread or contains spread, you hardly can detect any infected cell after 20 weeks here in this case. So with this technology, you can not only go into the peripheral blood, but you can also reach the relevant tissues with respect to HIV infection. So a big issue certainly with all these genome editing approaches is uh, potential uh, uh, gene, uh, gene uh, genomic toxicities or uh, side effects, unrelated or undesired side effects. Because we are preparing currently uh, an early clinical trial with BRAC technology, uh, we, uh, we are in discussions with the overseeing agencies here in Germany, and we had to prepare uh, many, many uh, tests and controls that there are no off-target effects. So I don't want to go through all these uh, experiments because they were all negative or in other terms, even upon many weeks of conditional uh, constitutive break expression, we cannot see any detectable cytotoxicity, immunogenicity and or vector toxicity and so on. So, and remember this is upon constitutive break expression and we, as we have just seen, we only express break in HIV infected cells for a short period of time. So if we talk about uh, gene therapies against HIV, there are basically two approaches in these days. So one takes out the cells, either CD4 positive T lymphocytes or CD4 positive hematopoietic stem cells from the patients. 
uh, one does uh, ex vivo gene transfer introduction of the gene vector and reintroduces the uh, these uh, genetically engineered cells into the back into the same patient so we opted in our first clinical studies to go for hematopoietic stem cells because we want to provide a steady production a continuous production of uh, engineered or HIV resistant cells in the patient. So this is basically the clinical outline. So we are talking about a phase 1b 2a hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy trial or an ATMP trial, advanced therapy medicinal product trial which the acronym in our case is HIV cure. So it's a gene transfer construct, our break vector to remove HIV in patients that suffer from diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So there are a number of patients here also in Germany that certainly suffer from the lymphoma, but they are also HIV infected. And in these patients, uh, when they are treated for the lymphoma, they have to undergo chemo our job chemotherapy. And when we see partial remission after the fourth uh, injection of chemotherapy, uh, we will select some of these patients, mobilize them with GCSF, so their hematopoietic stem cells are mobilized out of the bone marrow in the peripheral blood. And then we will isolate by leukapheresis Sorry about this. By uh, leukapheresis, uh, the uh, stem cells, and we will do an ex vivo gene transfer here. Can do all the quality controls, and when the patients through their uh, lymphoma uh, treatment, uh, they will receive their own genetically modified by autologous reinfusion genetically modified cells. So uh, we hope then that over time the hematopoietic system, a hematolymphoid system of the patients will reconstitute more and more with cells that are protected from HIV or in other words, due to BRAC expression, they can take out or uh, remove HIV from these cells. So thereby functionally reconstituting the immune system of these patients. So this is safe because we can keep these patients on classical combination therapy onto ART. And then if there are enough, we can see enough genetically modified cells in the periphery of these patients. We can closely monitor these patients, take them off ART and see whether we see a viral rebound. If there is a rebound, we immediately put the patients back on ART. So this is relatively safe. So primary endpoint is feasibility and safety of antiviral gene transfer into hematopoietic stem cells. And secondary endpoint with this early clinical trial is engraftment certainly and uh, of this uh, gene modified stem cells and detection of these cells in the periphery. So these are the study site and players. Uh, the patients are treated here in Hamburg on campus by Professor Niklas Kröger. He's the uh, head of the clinic for bone marrow transplantation at the University Medical Hospi Hospital and also by Olaf Degen who, who runs or is the head of the HIV ambulance center here at the clinical uh, center. Um, the, the patients are treated there, the cells are isolated and they're shipped to Frankfurt to uh, the Institute of uh, Transfusion Medicine run by the German Red Cross, because there we have GMP laboratories to do the transduction of the hematopoietic stem cells. This is performed by Professor Harvard Bernick here. The vector itself is produced uh, under GMP conditions by Milton e. Biotech in Germany. Then the cells will be shipped, transported back to Hamburg and reinfused into the patients as you have just seen. And in follow-up, we will also, the Heinrich Petty Institute will be involved in the follow-up of, the, of these patients. So, where do we stand with the HIV-acute trial? 
So first of all, it is most important, the cure trial is fully financed by public money, by the Federal Ministry of uh, Education and Research uh, of Germany, by the local, Germany is a federal state, so Hamburg is also a federal state, has their own Ministry of Research, uh, and by the Else Grön of Fresenius Private Foundation. Uh, all these ATMP trials uh, and gene therapy, antibody vaccine trials are overlooked uh, by in Germany by the Paul Ehrlich Institute or by the innovation office at the Paul Ehrlich Institute. And with these colleagues and experts, we had a series of, uh, of uh, meetings and discussions already and uh, uh, have seen conceptual agreement on the production, on the non-clinical experiments, and on the overall study design. And particularly uh, for people living with HIV, to, uh, it's important to note here that during the last sessions, the Paul Ehrlich Institutes or the experts there by themselves actually suggested uh, to open the trial also not only to uh, patients or, or, or subjects suffering from large B cell uh, leukemia, but also from uh, just HIV infected people living with HIV that suffer from some intolerance of classical antiretroviral therapy. So the trial will be also open to these uh, groups. GMP production of the vector is currently ongoing. It's, it's uh, ongoing at Milton e Biotech, as I mentioned, Germany. And the pivotal non-clinical studies using GMP pilot batch vector, they are near to completion or almost done. Um, about the Bodici technology, I will talk in a, in a, in a minute. And uh, filing of the clinical trial application is now expected in the first quarter next year. And first patient in is expected in the fourth quarter next year. So certainly we had some delay as everybody has during the, uh, due to the uh, overall COVID situation. This gives you a little bit on the bottom, all the parties involved in this highly complex, highly complex trial. So at this point, I would like to, to acknowledge briefly the young people in my lab uh, that developed uh, this BRAC technology into the clinic and also our collaborators. In our own lab, it was particularly Jan Chemnitz, Niklas Beschana, Ilona Haub and Mike Focus. Uh, who were involved in, in, in this uh, development. I mentioned our collaborators at the University Medical Center in Hamburg, Olaf Degen, Niklas Gröger, Julian schulze zuwisch Halvard Bönig who is doing the GMP transduction at the Red Cross Institute in Frankfurt. Also a uh, HIV expert uh, from the University Clinical in Erlangen, Thomas Harrer and Martin Däumer who is doing full uh, profile sequencing during the trial, our collaborators, Frank Buchholz, Janet Karpinski are our experts, collaborators and experts in recombinase technology. And from the medical, medical school in Hanover, Axel Schambach and Hildegard Bünig provided know-how with respect to advanced vector technology. This is quite a young and quite a good team uh, here. So what are the further developments of BRAC technology? Because the HIV cure is not everything. So on one hand, uh, we have the academic networks. In the meantime, also particularly in the US, but also in Europe, uh, some networks took up the uh, BRAC technology because uh, over time they now realized it's maybe not too bad to provide, if we are talking about genome editing to provide a technology that acts error-free in human beings. So first of all, this is the German Center for Infection Research uh, in Germany, involved in developing novel uh, delivery technologies. And we'll also talk about this in a minute uh, for direct delivery of break uh, recombinase. But in the US, particularly the American Foundation for its research uh, that runs a gene therapy project for HIV cure, uh, providing the genes or delivering the genes for encoding broadly neutralizing antibodies and CAR HIV specific 
CAR T uh, uh, receptors and, and, and gene constructs. And they include the BRAC technology in a combination approach and also to protect the CAR T cells from HIV infection. Uh, and uh, more recently in this collaboratory HOPE, which stands for HIV Obstruction by Programmed Epigenetics, which is organized, uh, coordinated out of the Gladstone Institute by Melanie Ott in uh, San Francisco, California, and it's funded by the NIH. Uh, uh, there is this program followed up by uh, this block, lock, and excise approach, so by silencing provile DNA and excising uh, the DNA with BRAC1 uh, technology. So these are the academic networks that are ongoing at the moment. But when we receive this uh, public funding for the HIV cure trial, and we are talking about roughly 9 million euros here for this uh, early trial from public funders, they insisted on to to found a startup company for up down the development the road of development in, in a couple of years to organize uh, potentially uh, phase two larger phase two trials and also to develop novel technologies for, for break delivery. And this company, Provax, uh, was, was started uh, recently. So what Provax is doing is actually showing here developing uh, curative BRAC1 based strategies. First of all, the delivery into hematopoietic stem cells. So what uh, currently uh, is set up uh, labs that uh, uh, can, uh, can transduce large numbers of, of, of uh, patient derived cells to have a more scalable approach. Um, and what Provax is using is this Clinimax Prodigy technology also developed by Milton E. Biotech so that we can transduce larger number of or the cells of larger numbers of patients in a, in a very efficient and reproducible way for stem cell uh, therapy. On the other end, I talked about uh, advanced vectors and we are working on capsid engineered adeno associated virus vectors for direct break delivery by direct intravenous injection into people living with HIV. Uh, either if this works in a couple of years uh, well, then either as a stand alone technology or as a supportive technology to the stem cell uh, to the stem cell therapy and as i mentioned we are working in different networks um, uh, to combine this in with, with uh, combination therapy particularly with ccr5 specific talines or with, uh, as I mentioned before, immune modulating strategies, broadly neutralizing antibodies, CAR-T approaches, uh, which is uh, actually a good idea to protect your CAR-T products uh, from, from uh, HIV infection and, uh, and, and providing an additional antiviral effect. And as like in this HOPE collaboratory, uh, combining this with silencing promoting agents in this block lock uh, excise approach. So these are actually the various strategies that are followed up uh, in these days. And with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. And this basically is a, a, a uh, image of the new concert hall in Hamburg down at the harbor area worthwhile to see uh, and, and, and to go there for a concert. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joachim. Uh, that was a great um, introduction and summary of the BRAC1 technology. Um, <clears throat> initially, you spoke about um, the protocol would involve people with uh, cancers. Uh, certain cancers and so on. But then you mentioned that the um, governing institute or the oversight agency and so on talked about opening up the protocol so that people who did not have cancer but who were living with HIV 
who had perhaps intolerance or treatment failure or, or something. Can you talk about that? Could also enter the trial. Could you just talk about that a little bit, please? Yeah, well, we were actually surprised because uh, if you talk about gene therapy and genome editing, uh, particularly in Germany, and uh, everybody is very careful. And so where the, the Paul Ehrlich Institute are, uh, to, uh, when we talked to them in the first two times, actually. So they insisted, uh, they insisted on um, that we go into patients that uh, like this uh, lymphoma patients that had to undergo some other or were, were suffering from a malignancy and had to undergo some, some chemotherapy. And on top of that, hopefully uh, resulting in a win-win situation, we, we were allowed to treat them with, with our break vector. Now, during the last meetings, I mean, time has changed. Maybe COVID has also something good. It took some time, you know, and there are gene therapy. There are more and more successes, not in HIV at the moment, but for inherited diseases and so on, more and more gene therapy trials and um, in the world and, 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 and things have, have changed over time. Then they started by themselves to suggest that we should apply also in the final clinical, uh, uh, clinical trial application, or we should include other cohorts of people living with HIV and particularly people have some, some problems with the current drugs or are, uh, are stigmatized and have some psy other problems, basically. So we are at a moment uh, with, with the community in discussions, which cohorts should, should, should be included here. Okay. Having said that, we have the funding and we are only allowed to treat in this first initial trial, eight to 10 uh, study subjects. So we cannot treat uh, many, many subjects at the moment. I understand. And you spoke about um, other potential collaborators at the NIH, the Gladstone Institute, and so on. Um, are they doing any clinical trials of BRAC1 themselves or? No, they are not at the moment. We are the, the only site that is doing BRAC1 trials or the first trial. These are all academic, uh, uh, non-clinical or pre-clinical academic research approaches at the moment. Great, okay. They Thank are looking you. for the best combinations. Right, and that's what I wanted to ask you. Uh, you know, in your one of your um, slides at the beginning, you mentioned you know you were going after the TAT, the transactivating yes. um, protein, and I'm just curious from a molecular biology perspective, why TAT? Why not VPR, viral protein? R well, this is, this is sim simple, but it's relatively simple. First of all, TAT is the first protein that is formed or synthesized when HIV is activated. Without TAT, yeah, there is no HIV replication. And, and, and second, it's a, it's a transcriptional transactivator that acts obviously on a little RNA, but still, we, it allowed us to engineer the internal promoter in our gene vector that is responsive to TAT. So if TAT is made, actually our gene vector is activated and produces BRAC. BRAC takes out the proviral DNA, then there's no TAT anymore, and then the BRAC vector is turned off, sits there, and waits for the next round of infection if there is any. So this, 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 this was the idea behind. So we actually thought our, uh, it's not necessary. I mean, we are talking expressing a, a genome editing enzyme in human beings. And although the recombinases are extremely safe because they act error-free, um, 
we don't want to express these enzymes constitutively for the rest of your lifetime, even in cells that are not even infected. Yeah. So it has gave us the possibility to to uh, to only express it in cells when we need it, basically. And this increases the, the margin of biosafety significantly. Now, when we talk about direct delivery, we are using like these engineered, capsid engineered AAV vectors, uh, vector versions that do that do not integrate in the human genome. So they stay there in the cell for a while, for a couple of weeks, and then they go away. Basically, they are diluted out of the human body. So here we use constitutive promoters. So when we direct inject this, and this is in the Petri dish now at the moment, these experiments in, in the lab. If, if, if we put this in, then goes into the cell, expresses the break recombinase. If HIV is there, it takes out HIV. If it's not there, doesn't matter in a few days, the break recombinase is gone yeah, because it's not uh, permanently integrated in the human genome. So those are the two ways we are trying to pursue at the moment. That's really interesting that it's not permanently um, integrated. And I think um, I really like your emphasis on safety, uh, the lack of off target effects um, with the SPRUC technology, because I do worry about that with some of the other technologies that are being explored. Um, Joachim, um, there was something else, and I'm just trying to remember. I mean, it was a, a wonderfully detailed presentation. You talked about after um, several, well, in this slide anyway, several cycles of CHOP, you get to, or our CHOP, you then, you know, transduce, infuse the cells back, and then you look, you said you would then assess to see uh, the relative proportion of these BREC um, uh, uh, cells that have BREC in them after the procedure. How easy or how hard is it to check for the number of cells or the proportion of cells with BREC in them? Uh, technically, it's quite easy. Actually, we can we do this. We can do this in the lab very easily by uh, digital PCR and, and isolate. The, the the big question mark is, to be frank, is can we introduce back enough number uh, 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 a number high enough of engineered cells to see an antiviral effect eventually in the patient? So because we are I mean, we are not wiping out the immune system or the bone marrow uh, of the patient, and, and this would be unethical. So we only make room in the bone marrow that we, when we reintroduce the engineered cells, that they find enough room and they engraft, and now they continuously provide a flow of engineered cells. So is the number of these cells enough to see an antiviral effect. This is something we cannot tell at the moment. And uh, to be honest, and this might also differ from patient or from study subject to study subject. In some subjects, we can isolate higher numbers of hematopoietic stem cells, in some subjects, lower numbers, and so on. Yeah, th this is why we have to do the clinical trial and see what happens. Uh, we, we expect that it will take a certain amount of time to see any effect. But if there is no effect and we see rebound, we put the patient directly back on the, onto their, what they are used to onto their art and then it's everything is safe. So from the technology, uh, the recombinase technology or also the vector technology, I don't see that there is any risk to the patients. And most technologies like mobile, mobilization and leukapheresis and stuff, this is all introduced in the clinic. Okay, um, great. That's fairly straightforward. I wanna wish you and your team uh, success with this and also for the patients and um, we have your email, so we'll be in touch with you in the future. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, 
once a clinical trial starts. Um, um, so I just want to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, is the very busy uh, Professor Christian Brander. He has a PhD in immunology from the University of Bern and uh, completed his postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School. And he is an expert on T cell immunity to HIV. He is with the ICREA Consortium and uh, he's a co-inventor of the HIV HTI immunogen, uh, which is developed by Elix uh, Therapeutics. Um, he's a co-founder of that as well. And he serves at, uh, as a curator of the Los Alamos HIV database and is an associate professor well, as well. Um, Christian Brander is gonna talk to us today about combinations of immune-based therapies to achieve a functional cure of uh, HIV. So uh, welcome, Christian. Hi, welcome, good afternoon. Uh, indeed, I would like to quickly uh, talk a little bit about immune-based therapeutic approaches for the HIV cure, and in particular, the HIFACAR trial, because that's where we partner with Giorgio and others uh, throughout the European consortium. But I was asked to quickly give a concept or a little bit an overview, some uh, shine some light on recent advances and then talk about the HIFACAR concept. That's what I would like to do indeed. So uh, just to start out, and I'm a little bit worried I'm praying uh, or I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, we all know that every, essentially everybody who becomes HIV infected makes a strong immune response to HIV. This is not a stealth virus that goes under the radar of your immune system. Um, so, but despite the fact that people do make an, in, uh, an incredibly strong and broad immune response to this virus, uh, we are unable to control this part. And so then if we just look into people living with HIV and measure their immune responses, they may be terribly not informative for vaccine design because evidently in vivo, in infected individuals, they don't do the job. And so we are really up to a big battle and a big uphill battle in, in defining what are the immune responses that we need to induce in a therapeutic setting. And on top of that, and not knowing what really we need to induce in terms of immune responses, uh, we also deal with a situation where we're going to vaccinate somebody that has already had an, an HIV infection will be to some degree immune compromised. So this is really not, not trivial, I think, a therapeutic vaccination in HIV because of the immune status of the individual to be treated. And then also us not really knowing what kind of immune response we need to induce. Uh, certainly in there, I think CD8 T cells will be instrumental, but possibly CD4 T cells will play a role combination with neutralizing antibodies and all delivered in the right um, uh, vectors. And on top of that, we all know that the viral reservoir is awfully silent and invisible to the immune system. And we need to find ways possibly also to reactivate this reservoir to then make our vaccine induced responses able to eliminate uh, that um, reservoir. So uh, just quickly going through three past clinical trials, some recent progress, I'm gonna spend more time on the last one, but starting out with the first one, which was a trial, all three trials actually conducted in the Barcelona area. The first one, a dendritic cell based vaccine where uh, Felipe Garcia and colleagues loaded autologous dendritic cells from patients with their autologous virus and reinfused those back. And indeed, there was a correlation between the time these individuals were able to stay off antiretroviral treatment and the induced immune response with this vaccine. But overall, the effect was awfully short-lived, and it only led to like a two weeks delay to ART restart in, uh, across all the participants. And then in the BCNO2, this was Beatrice Motte, uh, who published this work last year. Uh, we had used uh, viral vaccine vectors expressing conserved regions of HIV, and these were delivered by the chimpanzee adenovirus and MBA in combination with a latency reversing agent, romidepsin. 
And at the end of the long trial and rollover studies, we had uh, 13 participants who went into treatment uh, interruption of which four uh, stayed off antiretroviral treatment for more than 24 weeks. And, and indeed also in this individual, we saw again that the people with the strongest immune response uh, were amongst the ones that made it out the longest without the need of starting ART again. But it was also the ones with the lowest reservoir uh, that made it out there, indicating that indeed we possibly need to find ways to reduce that reservoir or make it more visible to the immune system to allow participants uh, to further stay off uh, treatment. Um, so, and then the last one is the uh, IELIC002 uh, as a disclosure, and you mentioned it just before, Sean. I'm also a co inventor and co founder and shareholder of IELIC Therapeutics in Barcelona. And in that context, we conducted the IELIC002 trial, uh, which was a, vaccine, a placebo controlled vaccine trial in 45 individuals. And at the end of the day, we had 20 vaccinees, uh, when we looked at, at the individuals without certain host genetics, uh, that out of the 28 made it out to more than uh, 24 weeks without taking antiretroviral treatment. And I would like to quickly take you through some of this data. ILIC002 was a very long trial. It started out by vaccinating 45 individuals with certain DNA and MVA vectors that express the HTI immunogen, which uh, we had uh, developed at, at Irsikasha over the years before, which is essentially uh, an accumulation of about 16 regions of HIV that we find particularly useful to go into a vaccine to induce robust T cell immunity. Uh, people were then rolled over, uh, 42 remained there, uh, were rolled over in a second phase where we gave the CHADOX1 expressing HDI, the MBA again expressing our immunogen and then uh, underwent the treatment interruption of 24 weeks. And just here, the early inclusion criteria in general, healthy early treated individuals, and I'll show the demographics. And then restart criteria, which are uh, evidently the critical component uh, to define how many people stay how long off antiretroviral treatment were as such that either an antiretroviral syndrome uh, or then a, um, a viral load above 100,000 once or to remain above 10,000 for eight weeks, but below the, uh, the 100,000 or a drop in the CD4 counts. And that would have all led to restart of the treatment again. And you see the placebos and vaccinees, they're all different in the, de in the relevant demographic uh, characteristics, just to point out uh, the time from estimated HIV infection was about two months. Uh, the viral load relatively high at, uh, ident uh, at diagnosis, indicating that you see here 10 to the 7 in both groups. Uh, we had also identified people with rather early infection, also reflected here on top in the, in the time from infection with 12 and 6 days from estimated transmission. Uh, and then uh, finally on the bottom, but I'm not going to go into it, we do control all this clinical trial for the host genetics in the HLA for various reasons. But if there are questions, I'm happy to, to follow up. But just in the interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, this is the immunogenicity analysis. So after all these vaccinations of DNA and MBA and CHAD and MBA, you see on the left side in blue the placebos. Uh, what is shown is the strength of the immune response. So how many cells were induced to make now a T cell response against our HDI immunogen. And you see this really only one individual with a pre-existing and persistent response to these regions. And the whole rest in the placebo group really doesn't make any response. Uh, compared then to the active arm, where we see a very strong induction of T cell responses to HDI in the red lines, that lasted well on to the time point when we started interrupting treatment. And these are amongst the strongest responses, I think, reported in the field. So our vaccines were also, aside from being safe and well tolerated, they were also highly immunogenic. And of course, then how does this translate into virus control once we stop treatment? Uh, please do focus on the bottom 
uh, graph on top is the, the entire cord. On the bottom is again, uh, limited the analysis to the people that did not have a beneficial HLA host genetics. And what you see here is that in the placebo, we had one out of 12 participants that made it out to 24 weeks. Uh, whilst in the, in the vaccinees, we had eight out of 20 uh, vaccinees that made it out to 24 weeks. So we have uh, about 8% in the placebo versus 40% uh, in the active arm. And important uh, over uh, this, and because I was asked also to quickly touch uh, upon the, uh, the fact that this, con this clinical trial was conducted during the heights of the COVID pandemic in Barcelona. We did not lose anybody for follow-up during these times. Also, most of the treatment interruption was actually during 2020. And we had put amazing efforts and a fantastic team behind that uh, to prevent uh, then uh, infection, to do home visits, and every register we pulled to make sure people would not just stop coming back to the cleaning or uh, clinic or to testing. You see, however, we had two individuals that got infected with COVID at week 22, and this was back in March 20 or in May, uh, yeah, May 2020. And uh, at that time, we really didn't know much about COVID and these were immediately uh, put back on treatment. But their characteristics were so that they would have made it very well out to 24 weeks. So I do take the liberty of including them as making uh, uh, being off treatment for 22 to 24 weeks uh, indiscriminately. What's important for us is that the HTI specific immune response was the strong predictor of time of ART. So it correlated positively the stronger the immune response that we induce with our vaccine, the longer the individuals were able to stay off treatment. And on the right side, it's also shown that the more responses to different regions of HIV covered by our imaging uh, these participate, participants made, the longer they were able to stay off treatment. And this is really what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a vaccine that boosts responses, T cell responses to certain region of, of HIV that we think it's worthwhile. Remember the first slide, everybody makes a T cell response to HIV, but very few people only can really control the virus. So, but we, by augmenting these responses to the regions that we think matter, uh, we were actually seemingly able here to help individuals to remain of ART uh, for a prolonged period of time. And always, of course, based on the restart criteria that we had put in place uh, before the clinical trial. And so with that, then just coming to the last uh, few slides about HIFACAR, this is a, a trial and, and maybe Georgia wants also to uh, comment a little bit uh, further about their involvement, uh, a clinical trial that goes a little bit further than our design. And I just need to put in one technical slide here. And this is all about T cell escape of the virus. Imagine you have a virus here shown in, in yellow, little pieces of this virus are being dropped apart in the cell and they're presented on MHC or HLA molecules to specific T cells that can recognize this complex of peptide epitope with the uh, HLA molecule. And that will lead to the elimination of the infected cell and hopefully to control of viral replication. Now, if the virus is changing just a single amino acid, it can happen that this epitope now in green does no longer bind to the HLA molecule and the CTL will, the T cell, the cytotoxic T cell will no longer react uh, or see this infected cell, we no longer kill it. And so the green virus can now grow and take over. And this essentially every epitope in HIV, this can happen, but it happens more often the longer you're infected with higher viral loads. It's the same with drug resistance. The more virus you have, the more diversity, the higher the chance the virus can escape those CTL mediated restrictions. In the HDI design, we try to counteract this effect by including relatively conserved regions. 
uh, of the virus into the vaccine. In Hifikar, we actually go a step further and it's a totally personalized vaccine where we only include regions of the virus and epitopes actually that are conserved, that have not already escaped because it wouldn't help us to induce a response to a, a, a epitope sequence that is no longer contained in the virus of that individual. And, and so this is uh, supported that this happens on and on in natural infection in a, in a very nice study a few years ago by, by Bob Siliciano, where he showed these are different epitopes here, SL9, these are different acutely infected individuals. And in blue, you can see that many of those individuals and different epitopes are still conserved in blue, the wild type. But in the chronic phase, you see most of these epitopes have now escaped because there is an immune response, the virus adapts, and you can no longer think of using that peptide sequence to go and vaccinate because the virus has already gone uh, from that uh, recognition. And so this is what we do in, in uh, HIFACAR. The therapeutic vaccine is based on identifying conserved T-cell epitopes in GAG and in Paul, and based on, on the arguments that were discussed in the previous talk, we include full length TAT, because it's a very early uh, expressed, together with a very early expressed protein that will sensitize those cells very at the earliest possible moment for CTL recognition. And we put this here, this string of epitopes and full protein autologous protein sequences into an RNA vaccine and vaccinate our participants with this. On top of that, we will apply a broadly neutralizing antibody for different reasons, but the foremost is, as you know, a, a soluble, highly broadly neutralizing antibody can actually suppress viremia as long as the virus is sensitive to the antibody and as long as the antibody is present at sufficiently high levels. And so we can want to combine the T cell vaccine and the neutralizing antibody at the same time to suppress viremia and allow the T cells to find the cells that express their epitopes and eliminate those. And to make sure that those cells really express virus and viral antigen, we also can apply romidepsin, the uh, latency reversing agent that was used in the BCNO2 uh, trial before, uh, which I don't think is a superbly strong LRA, uh, but I think still among the least worst. Uh, so not the, maybe not the strongest, but also uh, there are really not many other uh, very strong uh, LRAs uh, in use these days. So with that, uh, just as a summary then, HIV induces a very broad and strong immune response in, in natural infection, but this is evidently a not efficient, good enough immune response that could control the virus to low levels where the individual would not transmit the virus and where the individual would not get sick uh, or and develop progressive disease. We really don't know yet, and still after 30, 40 years, we are still struggling to understand what would be the right immune response. We all think that for the therapeutic use, T cell responses may be critical for a preventive, possibly antibody. And in all reality, it may be well be a combination of both. Uh, but where they need to target the virus, et cetera, is really, um, I think, a, a still an open question. The IELIX002 trial uh, has shed now some light on the fact and how a, a rationally designed immunogen could help us to, uh, to work. Sorry, I need to quickly hammer on a wall here uh, for the noise. I'm sorry for that. Um, then the AO002 trial has shown us that with a rational designed immunogen, it's possible to induce responses T cell responses that are associated with prolonged control of the virus. And uh, in HIFACAR, we take this to the personalized level, really looking at the own individual's own virus uh, to build the T cell immunogen and combine it with a uh, broadly neutralizing antibody and latency reversing agent. 
Um, but in all reality, this will be one further step. I think vaccine development, preventive or therapeutic, will be an iterative process that needs to build on stepwise uh, increased understanding of, of our uh, candidates in the pipelines. And with that, I just want to thank especially everybody in the HIFACAR, uh, Felipe Garcia, Monse and Lorna, uh, that uh, together with Chris Mann have really pushed this where we are these days. We are terribly delayed and not lastly because of COVID. Uh, we are a large group of uh, European partners, uh, amongst them the European AIDS Treatment Group, uh, distributed across uh, all most countries, and then everybody in Barcelona at our own institution at the Irsigasha Checkpoint, uh, and uh, as well, of course, the funders. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, for that uh, great summary of the work that you and your colleagues are doing in Barcelona, and we see there are our dear colleague, Michael Mühlberg, who is also uh, the community representative there. And he is also a member of the EATG. Um, and we just had a, a comment from Richard and he, it's just a general comment. We do not have the time for, for this, but Richard has asked that, um, has mentioned that not everybody would define a viral load of less than 10,000 copies as, virological control, and it would be great if cure researchers around um, the world had consistent definitions of that type of terminology. So it's a comment to take into account, uh, not for discussion now because we don't have the time. Uh, one quick question, Christian. Um, do you have any uh, further trials coming up in, in the next year or so that you could just briefly tell us about because we don't have a lot of time? Yeah, so we are currently awaiting approval uh, from the Spanish regulatory for the for first of its kind, I think, vaccine approach, again, therapeutic vaccination, where we combine the T cell vaccines with SOSIP envelope proteins in the therapeutic setting. And we hope that since those individuals will have already mounted some kind of T-cell response, we can pick them up and drive them quicker than in, in preventive setting to make neutralizing activity. Uh, so that is uh, hopefully being approved by the end of this month and we would start immediately. But uh, please do allow me to, to absolutely agree with Rich uh, before about the 10,000. Uh, we have Beatrice Motin have recently wrote uh, a commentary where we, have, we where we really ask that this kind of studies should be uh, comparable across different studies and, and fields. Uh, everybody uses a little bit of different cutoff. Uh, it's also important to say that an initial viral peak is observed in almost everybody. And if we are too conservative on that one, this is what happened in the Thai trial, not in the RV144, in the therapeutic trial recently. Um, if we just put everybody right away back on treatment, up on virus become detectable, every therapeutic vaccine trial will fail because people go straight back on treatment within two weeks or three weeks. So we need to allow for a certain initial peak of viremia. Great. Um, nice point, Christian. We encourage you to have um, that discussion offline and so on. But we need to um, move on to our next speaker, and I hope he's ready. Or, so I'll introduce him in the meantime. Uh, am I okay to? Yes, okay. I can go ahead, Giorgio. Great. Um, our next speaker is Professor Jean Daniel Lelievre who is a, a medical doctor in internal medicine, and he also has a PhD in immunology. He's a professor in immunology since 2010 and heads the Department of Clinical Immunology and Infectious Diseases at Henri Monton Hôpital in France, and he has an INSERM team as well. He has focused on T-cell apoptosis, uh, a problem with this retrovirus and uh, and also on um, TREG biology, Turing HIV infection, T cell development, and uh, what happens to T cells with HIV. 
uh, lately he's been refocused on vaccinology and he's involved, been involved in research on an HIV vaccine with the Vaccine Research Institute and the European HIV Vaccine Alliance. Um, and he's doing lots of exciting things. And so without further ado, I would like to ask Jean Daniel to uh, begin his uh, presentation. Thank you for being here today. Thanks a lot to give me the opportunity to present uh, our clinical trial, the EVA TO2 trial. So I will present the trial. I will explain the, the issues we, uh, we add with the uh, implementation of this trial and how we, we deal with all these issues. So I, I will begin with a short presentation of the of EVA, the European uh, HIV Vaccine Alliance which is a consortium including 39 partners in, in Europe with 11 countries involved in Europe, but also in Africa and the US, including leading scientists from different fields of expertise, including a social science. The EVA2 clinical trial will take place in different countries in, in Europe. Uh, we will have a three a different clinical centers in, here in, uh, in France, in, the, in, in Paris, and we will have one clinical trials in five other countries, in Switzerland, UK, Germany, Spain, and Italy. We also have uh, participating labs include in these uh, clinical trials, two in the UK, one in Liverpool, and one uh, aided by Yavi in London, one in uh, Switzerland, in Lausanne, two in France, in Paris and Strasbourg, and one in, in Germany. The sponsor of this clinical trial is the INSERM INRS here in France. Uh, the, the trial will be conducted by the uh, CTU of uh, Shinama Comac uh, in London, in the UK. And uh, we uh, will have a, 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 an help from uh, the AETG and Yavi to assist us for the communication surrounding the, this clinical trial. So uh, here are the, the timeline of the, this clinical trial. The, the first uh, um, clinical trial was called EVA T01 and which was launched uh, five years ago uh, in the first annual meeting of uh, EVA. And you can see at the bottom of this slide, the issue we uh, add uh, with the, this, uh, the implementation of this clinical trial. And I will explain how we deal uh, with the uh, with all these issues. Uh, it was um, at the beginning a plan to uh, perform, a, I, I will say, a classical uh, therapeutic vaccine uh, clinical trial using a prim heterologous primus combination of two vaccines, a, a DNA vaccine from Fit Biotech, a Finnish company, and uh, the MBA HIVB uh, vaccine from the uh, the INRS. Later on, it was planned to add uh, an immunomodulating agent to, to this combination. However, uh, due to a uh, uh, biotech went bankrupt, uh, so we, uh, we uh, and uh, biotech was the, the firm that uh, was uh, about to, uh, to provide us the, the the DNA vaccine, so we decided to, to move to uh, the second phase of the, uh, of the clinical trial, combina uh, combinating, combining sorry, um, uh, uh, an homologous uh, vaccination with the MBA uh, with uh, uh, an immunomodulating agent. And we use as uh, immunomodulating agent vedolizumab. Uh, why vedolizumab? Uh, vedolizumab is an uh, antibody uh, directed against an antigreen, alpha-4, beta-7, and it's largely used for the treatment of the Crohn disease. And we take the opportunity to have the, uh, uh, very uh, encouraging results from uh, um, experiment performed in, uh, uh, in macaques, uh, showing that uh, the uh, vedolizumab was able to uh, to control viral replication after treatment uh, interruption uh, in, in uh, infected uh, monkeys. However, uh, the, these encouraging results were not uh, confirmed in uh, three uh, further uh, macaque uh, studies. 
why it was not uh, confirmed. Uh, first clinical uh, uh, study was launched by the, uh, the NA, NIH before the, the, uh, the results of these uh, three last uh, studies. And uh, uh, you can see here the, uh, the criteria to uh, enter in this clinical trial. They include people living with HIV stable on CR for at least two years with a CD4 uh, T cell count more than 450 at baseline. And you have uh, four different uh, criteria to restart, two biologic uh, criteria. The, the first one was a four week sustained viral load of more than 1,000 copies of more. And I will discuss the, uh, this point uh, uh, looking at the, the answer uh, that uh, Kristen gave us on, on this uh, threshold. Uh, or 30% uh, uh, decline in CD4 from baseline or to, uh, to reach a CD4 uh, uh, T cell counts of uh, 350 or less. Uh, there, there was also clinical uh, criteria to restart, obviously uh, HIV related symptoms of pregnancy. You can see here the, the schedule uh, of this clinical trial with nine pedolizumab infusion. Uh, seven uh, during uh, the, the phase of treatment and two uh, that have been performed during the uh, treatment interruption phase of 20, 26 weeks. Th there was no uh, uh, control arm uh, in this clinical trial and the results were compared to the placebo arm from a different uh, previous different uh, therapeutic vaccine trial. Was it was uh, concluded uh, at the end that vedolizumab uh, uh, was not uh, efficient to control viral load. You can see that uh, one third of the patient reached uh, weeks 26 of the uh, treatment interruption phase without meeting criteria to restart out, which was quite encouraging. There is, uh, we have also another clinical trial performed by a Canadian uh, team. The inclusion criteria were nearly the, the, stay, the same with a, a CD40 cell uh, counted baseline higher, higher, sorry. And they also include um, a, um, a threshold for the, the nadir of the CD4 uh, cell count. Uh, which was supposed to be uh, more than two, uh, 200. Uh, for the restart criteria, the, you can see that they are quite vague. Uh, uh, they, they restart uh, out if the le level of HIV in the blood becomes too high, persists for too long, or if the CD4 count decreases uh, by too much, which is not obviously uh, very, uh, very clear. Um, the, the number of, in of infusion were uh, were only uh, in this case seven and not nine like the, uh, the, the previous one. And uh, most of these infusion were performed uh, during the uh, AATI uh, period. The one objective of this study was to define the, the, the best dose uh, to, to be given to the, to the patient. And they include two groups with a small number of patients, as you can see. Uh, and one receiving a 300 milligram per infusion of bedolizumab, the other one 150 milligram. So at the end, what uh, what, what what was the, the results of this uh, clinical trial? They, they they showed that they have, uh, as mentioned by Christian, uh, a rebound. But it seems that the area under curve of the, the viral replication was uh, lower in the uh, group receiving the highest dose of uh, vedolizumab. So to summarize uh, all these results, th there were inconsistency in MACTAC studies that cannot be uh, explained. We have two clinical studies, both with signal of an impact on viral load in some participants, uh, with uh, the 300 the milligram infusions seeming to be the, the better dose. And it makes sense uh, that the drugs may be more impactful during uh, the ATI based on mechanism of action. And there, is, there were uh, all these two um, clinical uh, study were not randomized. And we, we need, uh, obviously, uh, if we want to, to compare and to, to judge the efficacy 
uh, uh, the very good lithium to have a, a placebo arm. So uh, we uh, therefore we, we decide to uh, to perform uh, the EVA two uh, clinical trial combining uh, both uh, uh, vaccination with MVN. We choose MVN because we know that the, uh, this vaccine uh, was a potent inducer of CD4 and CD8 T cell response. We have results from a previous um, uh, vaccine trial performed. Uh, we, uh, in the uh, in the NRS, the WR01 study, we uh, I've just show you that we have a, a significant effect in reducing the peak VRMF after ATI and the viremia levels in the R and the, the curves in the Canadian Verdolizumab study, and we hypothesize that we will have a synergistic action of these two products. Uh, potentiation of the uh, HIV CD8 T cell response by MVA and a reduction of trafficking of CD40 cells uh, in the guts, uh, reducing the pool of target cells for HIV infection. So the uh, objective uh, of this clinical trial is to, to evaluate the biological efficacy of the combination in chronically uh, HIV infected patients and undergoing ATI compared to a control group. And we use the area under the HIV RNA curve as, as a primary uh, endpoint, uh, endpoint from treatment interruption to 24 weeks post treatment interruption. Obviously, we are going to assess the, the safety of distribution strategy uh, in our patients. Uh, the, the design, we, we use the same uh, number of infusion and, and uh, the, the, the fact that we will give uh, the, the same uh, number of infusion after ATI as uh, the, the one used in the Canadian study, we, will, we have chosen the highest dose of uh, pedolizumab, and the inclusion criteria are the same as uh, the, uh, the, the one uh, chosen by the Canadian team. However, we prefer to use a higher an idea, uh, CD4 uh, T cell count more than 3, uh, 300. We uh, decide to restart art, uh, as mentioned uh, by, by Christian, with, not with the, a very low uh, threshold uh, as 1,000 a copy, because uh, we think that every, everybody uh, is going to, uh, to, to fail if we are going to choose this kind of, uh, of uh, restart criteria. But rather, a, a very high le level of bioreplication or um, uh, de uh, decrease uh, of CD4 uh, T cell count less than 350. And uh, uh, regarding the, the results we obtained with a uh, previous uh, therapeutic uh, uh, HIV vaccine trial, the, the VRI02 clinical trial, we know that uh, uh, having uh, for a short period this uh, um, um, high level of replication, if you don't a decrease your CD4 uh, T cell count is quite safe. You see here the, the schedule uh, of the EVA TO2 with the three, uh, three arms, one combining the, the MVA and the, uh, and the VEDO here, uh, one only with VEDO and one with a placebo. You can see that it's an intense when visit for viral load are weekly. Uh, and it's important to note also that vaccine and infusion visit will take at least one or two hours. Uh, we, we have decided also to include in, in this clinical trial a social science study. The main objective of this study are to document the expectation regarding this clinical trial and motivation for participating in it, and to watch how these aspects change over time, and to evaluate participant experience with the trial and their satisfaction with it, especially during the, the period of uh, treatment interruption. Uh, this study will be performed by uh, an insert team aid by uh, Bruno Spear uh, in France, in, in Marseille. So the, uh, the, <coughs> the main other issue, uh, obviously, uh, for the implementation of uh, uh, this um, clinical trial was the occurrence of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID-19 infection. And if we look at the risk of uh, uh, disinfection in the, our clinical trial, we have three different kinds of risks. The, the first one is an 
I would say an epidemiological risk related to the incidence of in infection in the, the country under consideration. The higher the incidence is, uh, obviously, the higher the, the risk is. The second one is uh, related to the state of health, to be HIV infected and or to, to have comorbidities. And we know that there is a higher prevalence of this comorbidity uh, in people living with HIV. And the third uh, uh, type of risk are related to the trial itself, either to the treatment medication, to the fact that we are going to perform ATI, or to the constraint of the trial uh, and the frequent visits to, uh, to the hospital. So first of all, it seems that there is no impact on MV and SARS-CoV-2 infection. Why? Because MV is tested as a platform for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And we know that uh, this kind of uh, vaccine, attenuated vaccine, could have a non-specific protective effect uh, on SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. And you know it was one of the rational to use BCG uh, for a vaccination uh, against COVID. Uh, we also uh, know uh, now that there is no impact of vedolizumab on COVID-19 uh, infection. We have several publications uh, on this fact, and we can focus on on the one uh, of the, the left part of, of my slide. Uh, in this publication, they, they follow uh, 3,648 uh, uh, 3, uh, patients uh, on AD, uh, any IBD medication. 12.5% uh, uh, of them were on VEDO, and the VEDO use was not associated with hospitalization or severe COVID-19 uh, 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 infection when compared with patients uh, on all other medications. So what is the current knowledge on the impact of COVID-19 on people with, living with HIV? Regarding the, the prevalence, there is no evidence that COVID-19 uh, is more prevalent uh, among people living with uh, HIV. Uh, Regarding the, the COVID risk factor of severe disease, uh, it's quite clear and it's mainly due that there is a higher prevalence of comorbidity leading to more severe disease in people living with uh, HIV. Regarding the, the mortality uh, and the um, impact of uh, HIV infection alone, uh, it's, this point is more discu discussed. It seems that for some things, there is an increased mortality after adjustment for comorbidities, but uh, uh, this point is not uh, found in, in other studies. And uh, regarding the impact of uh, worse of count in, in patients with low CD40 cell count or detectable uh, HIV uh, viral load, it, it seems to be discussed. However, uh, if uh, uh, it seems that the, 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 the outcome um, could be uh, worse in people with, without any control of uh, HIV infection for, for many weeks. So you can see here that the, uh, the, the, the very busy schedule of the EVA2 uh, clinical trial that include many visits in the hospital. So uh, <laughs> when we end to, to beginning last year, um, <laughs> this clinical trial, we, uh, we saw this publication uh, made by the different uh, people around uh, of the world uh, on, uh, that aim to, to see how to miti mitigate the risk uh, of, uh, uh, due to, to SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection in uh, HIV uh, uh, cure uh, clinical trials. And there is a uh, several possibilities to, to decrease the, the, the risk. The, the first one is to be, uh, be very careful of the, the kind of people you want to include uh, in, uh, uh, in your cl clinical uh, study and patients with uncontrolled comorbidity uh, have to be, to be excluded from the study. And th there is other uh, recommendation uh, to, to, to try to decrease the, the risk. One of the recommendations is, for instance, uh, to, to perform, uh, to try to, to perform sampling outside uh, the, the clinic. So how uh, we deal uh, in, in the ever consortium with the, all the, the, the risk that, that I mentioned before uh, regarding the ep epidemiologic risk, obviously uh, this parameter is 
uh, difficult, uh, even impossible to control. However, uh, we decide to include a new inclusion criteria and is to have completed the notorious COVID-19 vaccination regime and 20 days or more prior to enrollment. There, there are currently a discussion of on the uh, on the on the third dose uh, is it mandatory or, or not uh, regarding the risk related to the state of health we uh, will set up a validation committee for the non-inclusion criteria to be sure that we will, will not include uh, a patient uh, with uh, several comorbidities and make them uh, at risk to a severe covid-19 uh, disease and uh, regarding the risk related to the trial itself, uh, I, I've shown you that there is no specific issue regarding the use of MVA and vedolizumab. Regarding uh, the, the fact that you, you may experience uh, viral replication or a slight decrease of uh, uh, C40 cell count uh, due to treatment interruption, there is no clear answer. And it would be possibly depend on the evolution of the pandemic and the, 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 the type of, of infection you, you, you have at, at this time. And related to the constraint of the trial and the frequent visits, we, uh, we want to consider uh, to conduct uh, sampling outside the, the hospital at the time of ATI, which, why it's, it's quite complicated because we uh, it's not usually performed uh, in the clinical trial in, in France. We, we are going to, uh, to, to begin the, this kind of sampling outside the, the hospital in one court uh, of a patient inf infected uh, with uh, COVID-19 in France, but it's only the, the, the beginning, but uh, maybe it will be important to consider if we have a new increase in the incidence of, uh, of COVID-19 uh, in the different countries where uh, uh, Eva Theodou is uh, expected to, to take place. And we are going to regular, uh, to, to perform regular testing of SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, in, in uh, people included in, in the clinical trial. And obviously uh, we will perform, we will stop the trial treatment and ATI in patient who become uh, uh, infected by SARS-CoV-2 uh, during the, the trial. So in conclusion, uh, EVA TO2 aims to assess the efficacy uh, of the vedolizumab with and without MVA in the control of viral rebounds. Is it, it is the first and only randomized control trial to assess the, the effect of VEDO, and I think it's still relevant to look at uh, the effect of this uh, molecule. It is intense and will require dedication from participants, dedication of their time as well as themselves. There are risks with and without the pandemic, but we really we will mitigate against these. Uh, and I show you how we, uh, we deal with this issue. Nonetheless, it will be important that participants understand and believe in the, the rationale of this uh, trial. And we are appealing to the HGG community to help us in the endeavor. And I will thank all the people involved uh, in the uh, EVA consortium and especially uh, Shinama Cormac and his team in, in London. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Jean-Daniel. And now we're um, running out of time, but I would ask you and Christian and uh, Yogi Bear to stand by in case um, we have any other questions. Thank you, Sheila. And um, now I'd like to bring on Giorgio. Uh, Giorgio, please uh, come on. We're going to have a very brief uh, message from Giorgio. And if we have time, we'll take questions, but go on Giorgio. Uh, yes, so um, I think I'm, I'm trying to be very concise and bring the main message from, um, from the community side because uh, I'm making here a bit of step back because uh, after the presentation of, of Christians, uh, um, I, I will, it was a very great presentation because it allowed me to, to speak very briefly about what we are doing as a community within the IVACAR study. So uh, Jean Daniel, you are present also from the IVA um, um, uh, uh, project. There, there is a, a session dedicated to uh, psychosocial research 
And this has been taken over by the community partner, EATG, but we have been working in close collaboration to our uh, allies also in terms when we were designing our surveys uh, to talk to the, to the participants of the study and people living with HIV about knowledge and expectation among people, uh, about the community, uh, about reaching a potential uh, therapeutic vaccination or solution or cure, HIV cure strategy. Uh, I will not go through the slides because this has been already presented, but we are responsible, we are taking over the part of the psychosocial research within the study. Uh, this is going to be run in the country where the clinical trial is going to plan. So it's going to happen very soon um, after the delay for the, the COVID, but we, besides the, the, the clinical um, venues, we are also uh, foreseeing um, an interaction, or at least we are trying to get gather inf information from the larger community of people living with HIV. So there will be two parallel studies. The first uh, will have a kind of longitudinal component uh, looking at the change within the, the clinical trial participants, while the second one will, will monitor the knowledge and the um, expectations uh, within the community at large. Um, so this is a uh, work in progress. We have designed the, the, the surveys. Um, they, are, uh, they are comparable, although there are slightly some difference uh, between the participants and the participants, obviously, but we want to compare the two, the two, the two courts. And um, we have uh, compiled several, we look at several study and compiled a, a very thoughtful, a very detailed questionnaire about expectations uh, touching on different domains from you know, passing HIV towards uh, fewer uh, fear of uh, side effects and or even stigma and discrimination is mentioned within the, within the list of questions. Uh, I will not go through the methodological aspect, but for me it's very important to, to say that we have the, the, the general the, the survey for the general um, group community at large is already online, and we are happy to give more information. There are the surveys have been developed in the different languages. We have two wonderful wonderful members looking at, the, at that and trying to link with the communities, but any help is uh, welcome. So if you have any uh, channels or information how to, to disseminate this, this, um, the link to of the survey's information about the survey, please don't hesitate to reach out, reach out to, to me and I will be happy to, to give you more information. And I would just like to thank you all for, for the, the wonderful speech and for coming here together and, and, stay, and helping the community to bring more information on, on research on cure and therapeutic uh, vaccination. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Jean-Daniel, Christian, and Joachim for their great presentations today. Um, really great background, really good research. I'd like to thank all of you who took time to visit and watch our webinar. As I've said, the EATG will have uh, webinars in the future on CURE in 2022, CURE slash remission. Um, we went over time, so we have no more time for questions, but I'd like to thank the nice EATG staff, uh, Giorgio, Rocco, Fiona, uh, Richard, and other people who asked questions. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone, but we're over time and, and we have to go. So have a great day and a great week. Thank you, bye.